and the SEO a little bit. We good? You guys will have, there's wireless mics and there's this too. There's like lavaliers and like, yeah. Yeah, we have extra mics too. The way I try to do this in the past is try to keep it uh, sort of unconferency. And so if someone has a question, Graham, or if someone wants to uh, ask you something and you're speaking, sometimes they'll just ask. <laughs> Um, so it's like a little bit not like a traditional conference in that way specifically, and it's also not like a traditional conference in the fact that, you know, this is about the live stream and the fact that there's tens of thousands of people who will be watching this today from all around the world. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's important to recognize the fact that there are cameras and to sort of pay attention to those cameras as opposed to ignoring them. Um, and uh, the other thing that I've learned from this is that we get a lot of questions off of Twitter, but this year because we're using YouTube, the YouTube has a Google Plus Hangout that puts in from it. So it's possible that we're going to get a whole bunch of questions coming in from that as well. Um, so you know, someone while you're talking, someone might very well ask you a question, you know, in the middle of a speech. So, and that, that's something that I really try to strive for is how to make a difference um, is to basically you know allow people to sort of be interacting with it and not just have speakers be on a podium and then you can't interact and ask them any questions and then it gets kind of boring. I, that's a really good question because this is the first year we've used YouTube. So I think in, once we get started, I'll be able to answer that question. I'm sorry. Did you see any good wildlife at least? I saw a deer and raptors. Sorry about that. So, Akron, are we ready? Yeah? So, Akron, can you give us like a countdown? All right, guys, we're going to get started, so if I could just have everybody. Okay, I'm going to. Can we only. I'm going to get started, okay? Efren, tell me when. Good morning. I'm Alan Silberberg. Uh, welcome to the fourth annual Gov 2.0 LA event. I'm very proud to, uh, that we're having this again. And I'm also kind of humbled this week. Um, we've all witnessed you know, a powerful series of events that nobody could have hoped for. And I think that it's uh, an amazing thing to see how uh, the American people have come together in a time of crisis and have uh, collectively decided to uh, look at these challenges uh, that are now facing our country in a way that I think is proactive as opposed to being scared and pretending that you know nothing's happening and it's not coming to our shores. Apparently it did come to our shores again. Um, when I planned the themes for Gov 2.0 LA this year, it was actually six months ago uh, when I started thinking about the, the importance of social media in emergencies and how um, first responders are able to use social media now in ways to communicate to all of us 
that just two years ago or three years ago wouldn't have been possible, let alone most people would never have conceived of you know, the head of a major police department of a major city using the media to then say, hey, use your social media to reach out and do this or to watch for something or you know, to share a message or here's how you can help. So we've come through, I think, a, a very incredible period of time. Um, you know, in 2008, when I first started getting interested in how social media could affect governments and, and really change the engagement cycle, um, the idea of, of first responders relying on something like Twitter as a news source it would have been unthinkable. If you had said to, you know, to someone, hey, there's this thing, it's Twitter, it's 140 characters, and if you look at it carefully, you're going to see the world's news happening in front of you at a very, very fast clip. And what we've seen time and time again this week is the idea that basically the, the mainstream media is uh, trying very hard to keep up with the crowdsourcing reporting that's going on from social media. They're trying to keep up with the idea that there's people besides themselves who have the news. That all of us actually, um, if you have a phone, a smartphone, or even a dumb phone as they're called, um, you have the ability to be a newsmaker, to share the news, and to educate people about what's going on. Uh, and I think that we've, you know, so this week demonstrated in real time and in a very horrific way, um, many of the things that, that we're here today to talk about. And I want to say, unfortunately, people died. And um, it's sad that we had to see that. Uh, fortunately, there are people like the people who are speaking here today, and I'm assuming many of the people watching on the internet, uh, who are actively involved in fixing these problems and in using these tools to help all of us. And I think that one of the things that I came away most impressed with this week, besides the fact that uh, you know, we saw people running towards danger at the same time as we saw people running away from danger. I know many people have made that comment this week, but that's a powerful image. And it's something that we saw uh, in real time. Um, and in real time nowadays means that real time isn't just when you're near a TV. The real time means that it's anywhere. If you have a phone with you and you happen to be anywhere near any kind of connectivity, suddenly, you know, you're able to not just, like I said a few minutes ago, share news and broadcast or, or report it, but you're also able to receive it and able to receive it in multiple uh, ways, whether they be short messages from your friends or updates, status updates on social media, or, you know, using your phone to stream the mainstream media news or um, from other websites. So, you know, we're clearly at a critical juncture. And, um, um, it humbles me tremendously to, to think that you know the people who are gathered here today to speak and everyone who's going to be watching online today, uh, you're doing it because you care. And you're doing it because there are some really important problems facing the United States, facing the world, and there's a recognition now that there's the, a technology and there's the, the ability to use that technology in a way um, that's very helpful. So with that, Efren, could you pull up my, uh, my slides? And maybe if we could dim the room a little bit. So as I said, I, I've been working um, in the idea of government 2.0 and, and engagement um, on a civic cycle for several years now. And um, are we, is this going to, I'm not. So is there a button? I'm sorry, this is live, so this happens. <laughs> um, Ashley, could you just hold on a sec? Well, we've got you two have your stuff. Great. I can turn this on, but I don't that know if it's cool. connected to that. Well, let's try it. This is technology as it goes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're here at Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. And uh, Pepperdine has been a wonderful wonderful host of Gov 2.0 LA for the last couple of years, and we're very excited about the partnership that we have with them. Uh, and we're sitting actually in, I believe, the smart classroom, um, which is wired for sound and audio and everything else. And so in the meantime, um, I'm, thank you. 
Uh, I also want to say thank you to uh, groups like Call Fire and NIC USA. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, this is interactive engagement using our, our speakers as tech help. Um, if you're following online, the hashtag on Twitter is gov20la, gov20la. Um, feel free to use it to ask questions. Um, also, I believe because we're on YouTube, there's a Google Plus Hangout being pushed as well. So we'll figure out how to take some questions through that in a second. Um, there we go. Thank you. Almost. We're almost there. Uh, and I would, <laughs> uh, as, a, as a live event, one of the things that happens is um, things like this. And I think this is actually a very important little lesson because communicators in government constantly have to deal with uh, evolving situations. As <laughs> Andrew Nevis is kind of giggling over there in the corner, um, you know, anyone who's facing the news cameras on any daily basis knows that uh, you know, you have to be prepared to roll with it, which is pretty much what I'm going to do with my presentation in a second. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there is. No, it's my, but, but it's right here, so if you could just. Well, I know, but it's plug <laughs> this thing. Have you done that before? Laptop time. Should be yes. Wait, this is the function. Yeah, this one is right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Efren, I don't know if people are seeing this online, so are they? Yeah? Okay, so my, uh, sorry about all of this. Uh, again, I'm Alan Silberberg. This is uh, Gov 2.0 LA. Um, if you're following on Twitter, it's Gov 20 LA is the hashtag. Uh, so I'm going to call my presentation the yin yang of Gov 2.0. And the reason I'm calling it that is because um, it's come really become very evident that the same tools that are being used to help people. Uh, get through crises, to help people pay their taxes online, to file business documents online, um, are also being used by governments around the world to harm people, um, to cause death, and to, to, to do a lot of things that aren't good. At the same time, there's also corporations that are doing the same thing. And so I think that we've now entered a phase where we all have to start asking questions about you know, what's actually going on here. And so I've identified basically three parts to the whole of this situation. And the situation, as I see it, is that um, everybody's very enthusiastic about the shiny new technologies. And they, they see something, they say, wow, this is something that's going to help our agency or our, our group or whatever it is function better or do something more efficiently. Um, but the, with the new, 
comes the good and the bad. And so what I've done, and you can't see it, so I'll show you. Um, this is what it is. It's, it's a funnel. And um, I think that the three things, good, new, and bad, are going all together in that funnel. And it really comes down to this. It comes down to how do you, people, use these tools? You know, how do we make the decision to do something that's good or make a decision to do something that's bad? But ultimately, these, these tools, which is what they are, social media, mobile, cloud, encryption, et cetera, they're just tools. It's like a hammer or, or a wrench. And if someone doesn't pick up the hammer or the wrench and use it, it's not going to get used. Well, some of these tools can be automated now. And you know, obviously, there's, there's a lot of companies and, and governments that are focused on using big data and, and computers in ways that are almost human-like. Um, but we're not quite there yet. There's still, you still need people to be involved. Uh, and, but then I came up with the number two, which is the bad use. Okay, and I'm going to get in there, hold up my computer here because this is truly interactive. Um, and I, I've identified it as basically cyber citizen tracking, okay, which r results in things like stolen identity, stolen money, stalking, death, prison. It just depends on which country you are. Um, and so I think that this is something that we all have to start paying attention to because you know, at the same time that a government agency might put in a budget request for some tools and they're going to say, gee, we're going to use this for good, um, well, who's to say that they're not using it for something else? At the same time, who's to say that there's people out there who have access to the same exact tools um, who may not be a government agency who might be trying to use it only for bad? Um, and so the, the, there's these lines now that are almost invisible. And um, I would say that, in fact, many of these lines have been crossed. That where it used to be you could identify who were the cyber criminals. You could identify you know, who was the bad guy. And now, basically, we're in this environment where the quote unquote bad guy um, can be anybody. They can be anywhere. You know, they could be 30 people at once um, replicating their IP address across the world, and you're sitting there trying to figure out who it is, but yet they're still trying to access your, your your systems, or they're trying to hurt somebody, or in the real world situation, maybe you know taking it a step further and going after uh, uh, utilities, or you know going after something uh, uh, infrastructure level um, because somebody said, "Oh, gee, there's a computer hole that we can go after." Uh, and so, th the question goes back to again what I said, which is the decisions that people make about how these tools should be used and implemented. Uh, I personally believe that these tools should be used in a good way. Now, this slide is, uh, was taken right after Hurricane Sandy, and it shows Twitter, but it also shows on the, the left-hand side here, uh, everything is in French, and on this side, it's in English. And what they did is uh, somebody decided to collect various Twitter uh, handles that were being responsive to Hurricane Sandy and put them together on a single web page, and, you know, clearly demonstrated here's the power of these things helping people in a very positive way. And I think that that's something that many government agencies and corporations start to really have to strive for right now. Because there's this, there, because we're at this point where the good, bad, the yin, yang are so close to each other that, that I think that basically governments and corporations have to make a, almost a conscious decision in a way to do the right thing. Um, to say we want our software to be used this way or, or only this way and we, we're not going to allow it to be cross-used in some other way that we didn't design it for or what it, we don't want it to, to, to be allowed. However, we're not quite there yet. I think we're at a point now where you know, there's still, like I said, it's sort of the shiny new thing and so there's a rush to buy things. There's a rush to get to the cloud. There's a rush to, to BYOD, to, to bring, bring your own device. Um, and, and sometimes the rush to that also uh, kind of leaves people out in terms of, well, you know, what's going to happen with this? What's the actual outcome of this technology beyond what somebody is saying? Here's what it, we promise it can do. Um, now, <laughs> this is a picture of, uh, it's a commercial art that I found online. Um, it's basically depicting David versus Goliath. And in the background here is, you know, Goliath soldiers and armies. Um, and I think that's where we are right now, 
is 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 just David versus Goliath, but it's David versus Goliath in the way that uh, you know the United States government might actually be David because Goliath is all these different players at all different times, and you never really know who you're exactly going after, and it's constantly changing, and it's constantly you know getting to a point of well, who are we dealing with? Are we dealing with the Chinese? Are we dealing with the Russians? Are we dealing with five companies? Are we dealing with uh, you know, the, the Mexican cartels? Who is it? Who are the players here? And I think that the questions start to become, you know, again, when you look at the sort of the, the two sides of government 2.0, um, and you start to say, well, really, who is David here? Who's Goliath? Because 10 years ago, David would have been the quote unquote, the hacker would have been David taking on you know, the big society, the big industries, and trying to go after the Defense Department or whatever. Um, but now, I think we're in a situation where uh, no one knows. And, and the problem is that the, the bad people are just as adept, if not more so, at using these very same technologies as the people who are on the good side. And so there's this constant give and take. The, the, the problem is that the, the people who are on the bad side aren't bound by any rules. And so they are free to do things uh, using the very same technologies that, that maybe governments or corporations can't do. So this raises a very big question, which is, <laughs> who is Big Brother? Uh, you know, and also a secondary question, which is basically, have we surpassed Orwell's wildest dreams? So who is Big Brother? Is it corporations? Is it, is it, big, is it big government agencies? Is it is it you know, some sort of mysterious group that owns a bunch of servers somewhere, but you've never really heard of them, but yet they own all the servers? Or uh, you know, is it a computer? Is it man? I mean, who's controlling Big Brother now? I think this is really where we're at a point where, and we saw it this week with, with everything, you know, everybody was talking about you know, the, the eye in the sky and, and how social media was being used to track and crowdsource. Um, but at the same time, there's some pretty hefty computers in the background trying to sift through all that data and sift through the keywords and the names and the places and the times. Um, but who's controlling all this? So, you know, when we're at a point now where if if government 2.0 is has is these two sides to it, then then I think a really big ethical question has to be who's controlling this? Is it a computer? Is it a man? Is it is it something in between? Um, <laughs> And, and, and if so, where are the boundaries there? And, and what are the boundaries that are being created by, by us as society? And what are the boundaries that are created technically? Uh, I'm originally from Philadelphia. And so this is a photograph of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. I took it with my mobile phone. It's a kind of a blurry photograph. So maybe it's good that it's not up on the big screen. Um, I took it because I think that this is where we're, we're at a very important part of our historical transition right now, which is, you know, 250 years ago, 240 years ago, if you wanted to be part of the Continental Congress and, and uh, try to affect the change that was going on, you had to be a rich man, a rich white man, actually. And you had to be in the room. You had to be in the room. You had to be in this hot little, you know, brick building in July in Philadelphia. And if you weren't in the room, didn't matter. Didn't matter if you're rich, didn't matter if you're poor, your, your, your voice simply wasn't being heard. Now, it's your mobile phone. Your mobile phone is the modern day equivalent for all of us of addressing the content of the Congress. Um, with your mobile phone, you can reach the world. Now, uh, with my phone, with this, you know, with this phone right here, I could, standing right here, if I wanted to, I could tweet, I could, I could actually start a live Skype conversation, um, you know, I could get on Google+, Plus. Um, I could probably reach tens of thousands of people separate from the live stream simply by my mobile phone. Um, and uh, I may or may not have something to say. <laughs> um, but all of us collectively now have this power, which is essentially you can essentially address the equivalent of the Continental Congress. You, you can address your peers. You can address the media, the, the powers that be, with your phone. You could stand on the proverbial soapbox on a corner, but now it's a digital soapbox. And it's not a corner. It's wherever you happen to be at that moment. Uh, and I think that this is a really critical time. So do you have an idea? 
you want you want to brainstorm something, tweet it, put it out there, see what happens. You know, suddenly you'll start getting some responses. People might call you dumb. They might say that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. But you're getting some free, uh, you know, crowdsourced information on your idea, like whether you like what you hear or not. Uh, if you want to organize, you know, go on Facebook and start using the various tools that Facebook has and and the ways that it connects people and their friends and the social graph and and organize and use the calendars and the events and, and you, you know, do things to actually take action. And take it a step further, um, if you're in a country like Syria and you're trying to you know, overthrow your totalitarian government, um, well, I have one word, encryption. And, and you know, if you want to try to stay safe and keep your family safe and, and, and do something, well, you have to rely on encryption. Um, and so we're at these stages now where you can go from basically on a smartphone like this, uh, I could both simultaneously do something publicly on Twitter, on Facebook, Google+, et cetera, and two seconds later, I could send an encrypted email and nobody would ever know the difference from right here. And uh, I, I just, I'm just an average person. So all of us now have the same power. And I think it's very important for all of us to recognize that you know, we do have this power. And it's sort of, I think we've seen it this week, unfortunately, you saw how people, how average people were drawn into the horrific events happening in Boston and happening in Texas. Um, and in Washington, in fact, where buildings were being evacuated and whatnot. But you also saw regular people helping each other through social media with their updates, with their pushes. You know, I'm at Foursquare, I'm, whatever, I'm here, I'm safe, don't worry, don't have to call me. You know, I think that we, we've seen a major transition. You know, in, in the old days, when there was an emergency, phone lines pretty much melted down because everybody was on the phone, like, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? <laughs> and now, you know, it's just sort of, like, hey, I'm fine, don't bother, you know, I'm on Facebook, whatever it is. But more importantly, I think that we, we collectively as a nation, as a world, social media allowed us to share something, share a tragedy together uh, in real time um, and mourn in real time together. Uh, whether or not you were in Boston or whether or not you had pictures or you didn't have pictures or but it still allowed us to share the same things and to learn about you know the family members of people who were killed or hurt um, and to, to read and share uh, collectively as a nation as a world maybe for the first time kind of the, the real-time impact of, of what a disaster means of what a crisis means to, to individuals to families to people to governments um, so I think that this week again, has just been tremendous in, in so many different levels, sadly tremendous on so many different levels. Um, and so I go back to what I said about shiny and new. Uh, I think that, you know, this is, this is an image of, of a, you know, just data basically going through a large data center. Uh, what works wonders for governments is doing good and helping people simultaneously um, without any change can be used uh, in extremely dangerous and um, deadly real life and real time ways and I think that it goes really comes down to a major question for government 2.0 government 3.0 moving forward uh, the question is how, do, how are these tools being used who's using them what decisions are being made to either hurt people or protect people and then and then I think secondarily you know as a society what sorts of controls can we start to demand um, that we have? Some sort of protections, whether they be anti-stalking or, or, or anti-harassment, or some, you know, how do we apply the same sorts of laws that apply in quote unquote real life um, onto the online life? Because now I don't believe there's a crossover. The online life has reached into the real world in such a way that I don't think you can ever take it away. And so it really comes down to all of us. I think the, the very basic questions, uh, so there's all these fancy, shiny tools. Are you going to use it for good, or are you going to use it for bad? Um, so with that, I want to say uh, we have some tremendous speakers today. In the next uh, few minutes, you're going to hear from Peter Biddle, who is the general manager of cloud services for the Intel Corporation and has a, a few things on his mind, uh, from what I understand. And uh, on Twitter, the hashtag is GOV20LAGOV20LA. And so feel free to use Twitter to send us questions. We'll be monitoring it throughout the day. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was. <laughs> um, and then so Pete Peterson's suggestion, who's our one of our hosts here at Pepperdine. Thank you, Pete.
Uh, we're going to take a five minute break. We will be back. Uh, we'll start our live stream again at nine o'clock. Um, so a seven minute break. Thank you very much.
play, the 2013. I'm Alan Silberberg. I'm thrilled to have Peter Biddle, who's the general manager of Intel Cloud Services, as our keynote speaker today. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking in my capacity as a private citizen at the moment, just for, for the record. So, um, uh, the name of my talk is A Darknet and the Future of Everything, and, and that's for a value of everything that's actually less than everything. Um, uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and I'm um, OBS3SD, which is what you have to do when you have a long name and you only have 140 characters on Twitter. Um, so when I say uh, uh, less than everything, what I, what I want to talk today about is public service, gun control, surveillance, robots, digital goods, terrorism, actions, the future, education, government, drones, drugs, physical goods, privacy, ideas, and thoughts. Um, and we have an hour, so I think I can, I think that's gonna be easy. So uh, in 2002, I published a paper called The Dark Net and the Future of Content Distribution with three other people at, at Microsoft. There was a anniversary story that was written in, um, uh, in the fall, 10-year uh, anniversary, which is kind of funny because nobody had called me up and asked me about the dark net for um, nearly 10 years, uh, celebrating the 10-year the anniversary of the publishing of this paper and one of the many times I almost got fired by Microsoft. Um, and uh, uh, Paul, myself, Paul England, Marcus uh, Panato, and, and Brian Woolman all wrote this paper. And um, to give you some context, at the time, uh, there was a tremendous amount of... Um, belief that uh, uh, technology would solve um, many of the woes that were being faced by the content industry. Um, uh, that you could use technology and DRM specifically um, to, to solve the problem of music piracy and video piracy and a bunch of other things. And um, this paper uh, sort of, sort of kind of um, completely disagreed and stabbed that premise repeatedly until it was dead. And um, this was particularly interesting, I think, for us because at the time we were probably the foremost, um, well, not foremost, that's a little uh, self-aggrandizing. We were kind of like the only people who'd been thinking about how to use technology to do DRM inside Microsoft for over five years. So when we published this paper, it was a, a little awkward. So let me talk about, um, uh, so basically we were saying this thing we've been trying to do for five or ten years, um, use technology to solve this vexing problem of, of content uh, leakage, content piracy, um, th that it's an actually unsolvable problem. So let's talk about what is, what is this so that we can bridge to talk about uh, using this as a giant hammer to solve all problems in the world. Um, th so the dark net is, a, and these are quotes from the paper, is a collection of networks and technologies used to share. Um, so let's talk about some of these technologies. Uh, we've all heard about peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, these uh, you know, were revolutionary in, in, the, in the 90s, but have become um, fairly commonplace. We use some of them probably in um, computing every day, right? We have, we have clients that let us chat that act in peer-to-peer -peer ways. Um, we do things like uh, Bluetooth connections between two devices that act as a peer-to-peer -peer network that let us do things like share content or allow our machines to interact in interesting ways. Um, and uh, uh, at the time, um, in the late 90s into 2000s, peer-to-peer -peer was views, viewed either as the sort of nemesis and destruction of all that is great and good about um, the media industry in the world today, or as the, um, the only way that the plucky uh, rebels would ever find to be able to interact with each other uh, sort of out from the prying eyes of um, formalized government or big business. Uh, and in reality, you know, it's, it's, it's turned out to be both, plus a bunch of other sort of fairly in interesting and useful things that have nothing to do with content at all. Um, another uh, kind of, of, uh, of dark net um, is a sneaker net. So uh, this is when you use your sneakers to network with something else, right? We did this in the room just now to get my uh, presentation from here over to the back of the room, right? Um, they're not sneakers, but close enough. Uh, and then we actually did it again to bring it back because I realized that the only version of my final copy that I had saved was on the dongle that I had to go get, right? So that's a round trip sneaker net event right there. <laughs> um, this is actually quite popular today for f sharing files because it's very efficient. If you have a, 
a terabyte drive you can buy um, at your favorite big box retailer for under 100 bucks. You can essentially put all the music you'd ever be possibly interested in on it and bring it to your friend's house and you guys can share and there's your sneaker net. It's a terabyte of data, completely unfettered, completely unregulated, impossible essentially to stop and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, forums, so forums have this great strength, this is internet forums, right? I, I'm uh, active in a few, uh, probably all of you are. Um, they are uh, a, an interesting vehicle for sharing sort of arbitrary chunks of data like, con like you know, photos or, or, or books or whatever, but uh, music, et cetera. But they're also an interesting place to share ideas. And there are forums that are sort of highly private, so they're very dark. Um, you know, you can't get to them, you can't find them, you don't really even know they exist unless you're part of the in crowd. And either those are like, they're, they're, they're private because it's just your, f like it's a forum for your family. You know, it's a thing you use to interact or connect. Um, it's a forum or a m system for emergency aid workers to communicate. It can also, you know, be a forum for child pornography, for terrorists, for whack jobs, for all sorts of people. Um, uh, but it's dark, right? Uh, a lot of times you don't even know it exists, and it's a it's a way to share things, right? You're sharing information, maybe, or ideas, or thoughts, or you know, that you want to lead to action. Um, so I want to make sure that uh, I'm clear about that. Part of what I've done when I've been thinking about the dark net and its applicability and and strengths and weaknesses as a sort of frame of thinking has been saying actually um, it's about sharing stuff, and stuff is not just movies or books, it's ideas, it's, it's anything, right? It's connecting two things and letting information pass in between those things. Um, Usenet is a great, uh, another example. So Usenet dates way back to the dawnings, uh, uh, fairly early on in the dawnings of the internet. Um, it's currently, a, a, a it remains a, a, a strong way to share content. Um, uh, some people I know prefer it to BitTorrent, for example, if they want to if they want to get access to to uh, Game of Thrones, by the way, I am a I am an HBO subscriber. Uh, I will also say that I found BitTorrenting Game of Thrones to be a vastly better experience uh, than using any of the systems I had in place to watch it in my home. Right, so I was fully licensed. To be very clear, I pay my Comcast subscription, I pay my HBO subscription, um, but uh, for me, getting getting copies that I could watch, which I did not share, um, to be very clear, uh, was, was a vastly better experience. And um, Usenet and BitTorrent are actually technologies that uh, are, are quite good at that. They're also good at other things, right? They're good at sharing ideas. Um, back, back in the day, you know, when I was on rec.arts.martialarts or, or, or rec.sport.paintball in the early 90s, which is my my earliest uh, 1990 I think entry into the inter interwebs, um, they were actually the primary preferred methodology really of uh, interacting in an un unmanaged, unregulated way, um, uh, outside of sort of the walled gardens of like CompuServe and AOL. And in fact, one of the things people will say is that w you know one of the days the internet died. Right? There's internet denizens have been complaining about the internet dying over and over and over and over again. But one of the days the internet died was when AOL gave all their members access in 1994, I believe, to uh, Usenet, right? And you know, and all these people who were uncool and didn't understand the interwebs now on Usenet and totally destroyed um, the internet, which is why it's gone and dead now and none of us can use it. Um, so if you're gonna say that a darknet lets people share things, well, is Facebook a darknet? I mean, Facebook um, gives me a lot of the controls so that I am, you know, at least ostensibly out, of, out from prying eyes. I can set up private relationships. I can set up multiple accounts. Um, I can share pictures. I can, I can share objects. I can use, use it for pointers. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, things like Facebook and forums actually help solve the namespace problem, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, our digital lockers like Bitcasa, Bitcasa is a startup. They're competing with people like Dropbox and um, uh, Box.net and others. Um, uh, they let uh, users basically store arbitrary stuff up in the, uh, up in the internet, you in know, vast amounts of it, and then share it out either just to, to themselves to move stuff around and synchronize information between their computers. The difference between synchronizing your photo album between two computers and pirating music is 
from a technology perspective, completely indistinguishable, right? So the notion of being able to have a web cloud service that lets you share stuff between your own devices or people who are part of your personal network, like your family or friends or kids, um, that technology sort of inherently, if it's going to be secure and powerful and help protect your photos from people who shouldn't see them and you don't want to see them because you want to protect your privacy, right? All of that technology is technology that can be infinitely um, repurposed for all sorts of other things. Um, some of them uh, highly, you know, um, potentially illegitimate or, 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 you know, clearly illegitimate. If, if what you're trying to do is share, um, uh, you know, information to perform a crime, then um, it's a great another great set of technologies to do that. Uh, that's what the dark net helps you do. Um, it also helps you just do things like share your photos. Um, Twitter, so uh, interesting thing about Twitter um, is its, its role um, in uh, the Arab Spring, uh, as a network that lets people communicate, in particular communicate in ways that are outside of um, totalitarian regimes, right? Which, which don't like dark nets and you know, particularly passionately because those networks let the nodes on the networks communicate without the regime being able to control thought and action. That means you can do things like send out pictures of the police beating up civilians for no reason and, and that makes the regime look bad and then they want to ratchet things down but as long as you've got access to the internet and you can share this then lo and behold you know uh, it's a very useful tool. So um, what do these things all have in common? They have uh, this notion of a namespace and I, wanna, I have a funny story about that um, and they have stuff and then the dark wave. See it's a dark net. Um, magic. Bad joke. They, they have stuff, they have nodes and they have links. Um, so let's, let's talk about uh, each of these. So we'll start with links. Um, links are physical or virtual connections. So these are just, this is the, the way things are connected, right? You can think of it as a wire or you can think of it as, a, as something far more virtual. Um, nodes are points in the network. So if you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer network, there's basically two nodes. You're trying to set up a link between those two nodes. Stuff, this is the, the stuff that's on the network, right? It can be um, anything from digital media to ideas to information to uh, whatever. Anything you can turn into an electron right now, and we'll talk more about that in a second, in a few minutes. Um, uh, anything you can turn into an electron is, a f is, a f is, is part of stuff. And namespace. This tells you where the stuff is. This is actually really important, and if you do the threat modeling to figure out how you wanna might want to shut down a, a dark net and the, the promulgation of unregulated um, information flow, one of the first places you, you, you go after is namespace. So um, uh, global namespaces are, 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 are things like URLs, like an URL is part of a, the DNS namespace. It's how you get to a web page. You type in google.com, everybody knows what google.com is. It's the job of the entire internet to always make sure that google.com resolves to google.com and not to something else, right? So the internet itself needs to make sure that keeps happening. So one of the hard things about shutting down namespace is um, uh, is is that a lot of times it's just part of the fabric of computing. So um, so a darknet is a lot like the internet, right? And in, in fact, honestly, you know, it's kind of cheating to say there is even a darknet, right? Because in a lot of time, a lot of cases, it, it just is is the internet. Sneaker net clearly is not. But the truth of the matter is that a lot of times the content came in via the internet to whatever it was, and then it's going in a sneaker net, and then it's going back out. That's just a particularly slow not very well managed link in that network. Um, so how do you control dark nets? Well, you can block the namespace, right? This is a very f this favorite one. If you watch the history of how people have tried to regulate the flow of information, um, and this, by the way, uh, as you'll see in a, in a minute, predates the internet by about 5,000 years, um, is you shut down you shut down the name access to the namespace or you block it, right? So shutting down Pirate Bay, um, uh, whether or not you think Pirate Bay are you know noble or complete jerks is immaterial. You, you know it was shut down because th that's a way to go after the namespace, right? It's to make sure that PirateBay.com or wh whatever their you know last role they had doesn't resolve. And if you actually look at what they did, they were a lot of those guys were constantly setting up shell companies, Pirate Bay 17, Pirate Bay 18, whatever, right? <laughs> you know. Uh, and then, and then when they get when they get you know served with a with a warrant, they just shut that. Oh, we're we're out of business. We don't know what you're talking about. And then they set up another one. Um, so you can throttle uh, throughput 
within links. So um, this is the equivalent of uh, earlier I had to walk to the back of the room and come back here. You could make me wear lead shoes, right? So it's very hard right, to get through the back, right? And then give other people fast, you know, swift shoes of running between the two nodes. Uh, deep packet inspection, which is something people talk about a lot and is one of those dual, uh, highly loaded terms. Some people view this as being, well, this is, you know, a, a highly necessary function that is not currently being performed. Basically, for the most part, network neutrality has ensured that, um, that all packets are created equal, right? The packet leaves, IP is responsible for resolving it, getting it to where it's supposed to go. Um, uh, and generally speaking, you know, packets are generally equal. There's things like constant content distribution networks that, that treat within their sort of, their little dark, you know, sort of not entirely dark, dusk colored version of the, uh, of the internet, that they can can move content around with preferential treatment, right? They can say, hey, we're gonna push this uh, movie out to an end node or something. But, um, so deep packet inspection is, is about actually pushing uh, into the network itself, into the, the, the essentially into the links, the ability to look at packets and decide whether or not a packet gets to the head of the class or not. Um, it's something that people uh, who are passionate about network neutrality view as an as a, as a extraordinarily negative term because it implies that some packets are better than others. That means that there is a bias in the network. Um, and, and bias uh, uh, in, in, in any technology um, has enormous repercussions. Uh, the thing that scares me about DPI is um, that as soon as you set up a futures market for, for packets, which is basically what we're talking about, if you look at it from an economic perspective, just look at it as a futures market, that means that if you want to have an experience that delivers you know, better than your competitors, then you wanna buy futures on your ability for your packets to land where they're supposed to go ahead of their competitors. The problem with futures markets is that the people with the biggest pocketbooks always win, um, meaning that people who have, oh, I don't know, $50 billion cash hoard or a $100 billion cash hoard could actually afford to hedge and make sure that their packets or the packets that are part of their sort of commercial enterprise are gonna get ahead of other people's. And who wouldn't do that, right? You have a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders to ensure that the you know, net result of what you do is successful if you're a publicly traded company. So if somebody created the ability to ubiquitously do DPI um, and inspect every packet and go, yeah, okay, this one gets to go, this one does not go, oh, we're gonna show this to the police, um, this one gets to go, ah, we're gonna hold on to this one for a while. Okay, now it can go. Um, then, then people are gonna spend money to ensure that their packets can get ahead of other people's, which you, know, you might say, well, that's sort of how free market enterprise is supposed to work. Um, but at that point, you can probably assume that the people with the deepest pocketbooks and the most to lose in, being, uh, in their packets being held onto for longer than, than they used to be, um, will spend enough money to make sure that their packets get to the head of the crowd. Um, Control, and, and there's a lot of intelligent, you know, sort of the, the notion of the DPI as a, as, a, as a managing the flow of information and thought in totalitarian regimes is a, is a known technique used by, um, used by regimes uh, uh, in order to help try to make sure that people don't get access to things like photos of innocent people being, um, you know, shot or tear gassed or um, whatever. Uh, it's also an interesting technique in, in, in a shaping a network. If you said, Peter, I want you to create the most efficient network on the planet, and then we'd have to argue about what efficiency meant. But one of the answers might be that some packets are ahead of, the o of others. A in the real world, we all pull over when there's, a, when there's an ambulance behind us. That packet has more value. We voluntarily decide to let it pass, right? Um, but you'll notice that we've never mandated the use of a, of a, of a kill switch in every car or robotic controls of every car so that the ambulance can make every car pull over which would be the equivalent of, of having that actually be part of sort of the fabric of how we drive and how emergency vehicles respond to pr problems. So you could try to control what happens inside nodes. Um, so uh, uh, back in the good old days of like the really evil Microsoft that was trying to you know, take over the world and, and do all those bad, nasty things that I worked at, um, we always let users be admin. It's kind of like amazing the difference between the old really scary closed computing of the 90s and the new really scary closed computing of the, teen, the teens because um, there's a lot of devices today, hundreds of millions of devices that you don't have admin rights on. 
and uh, and that's a that's you know that's a problem if you can install software on it and that that device chooses to not let you do things like not install apps you want to install or get to web pages you want to get to or use a browser of your choice or whatever um, then then you know you're you're basically being shut off from access to unregulated flow of information which is a reason you might want to be using a dark net um, and then you can make stuff it accessible. You can you can DRM content, so you can encrypt it, and then say the only way I'll I'll let you access this content is if you decrypt it, and uh, I'm, you know, uh, then you have to obey my rules. So um, there is no way for technology to permanently curb the darknet as long as there's an internet as we know it. Right. So that's that's um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna state that as a as a truth. Uh, that essentially is a, a core thesis of the paper we published in 2002. And by the way, as we know it, and love it or hate it, right? Because the, we all, I think, have have, um, have uh, whoever we are. There's things about the internet we adore, and there's things about the internet we revile, right? Um, uh, the interesting thing is, what what are our conclusions about the stuff we revile? Like, what are we trying to do, and 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 does that affect the things we love or the things other people love? Um, and I know this is true because I spent a long time trying to break, break the internet and build technology <coughs> that, that would have actually made, um, made the unregulated flow of information more difficult. So I started as the storage evangelist inside, uh, hardware evangelist inside Microsoft. I started in 90, but I that started that job in late, uh, late 95. And the first thing I found myself working on was DVD before it really had a name. Um, and we thought it was awesome and really cool. Um, but then it turned out that uh, there was this thing called the Video Home Recording Act. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of. Okay, um, and it had a document attached to it called the Technical Reference Document, which was like 90 plus pages of what was going to be a federal regu regulation mandating behaviors on all computing devices. So I read the VHRA, which is huge, and I read the TRD, and I went, okay. So if DVD requires these, then you know I w did went all Churchill, and we'll fight you on the beaches, and we'll fight you know like because because there's you know there would basically it would have it would have meant the end of of um, unregulated flow of information, uh, full stop, um, and it just wouldn't have worked. Uh, so that was a boo hiss moment. Uh, but what we then did is we formed this thing um, uh, pioneered by a, a gentleman named Alan Bell, uh, who at the time was a um, was at uh, in IBM Labs. Uh, called the the Copy Protection Technical Working Group, which became um, this this uh, hundreds of people meeting every two weeks for about eighteen months at different hotels around the world, trying to hammer out uh, an, an equitable agreement around how DVD would work in light of some people's intransigent insistence that we were not going to accept the law, and other people's intransigent intransigent insistence that their content needed to be protected, and other people's intransigent insistence that they just wanted to build VCR, you know, build a digital version of a VCR, and can you just tell us how to do it? Uh, those are basically the three industries: the PC industry, the content industry, and and uh, um, uh, consumer electronics. Um, and what that meant was um, a series of of essentially diplom diplomatic. Um, uh, interactions, right, where um, we sat in huge rooms with the hundreds of people. We actually added up the billable hours at one point. It was like it was like somewhere between one hundred thousand and three hundred thousand dollars a day in billable hours in the room, because we counted all the all the lawyers, um, <laughs> and we that probably was lowballing it. Uh, things that came out of compromises here were um, the term "user accessible bus," which uh, I, I I wrote. Uh, and is now, uh, I think, made it, it is in the DVD, C, uh, uh, DVD copy protection spec, CCA, CSS spec. I think it also wound up in the DMCA, although I was not an author on that. They just cut and paste from there. 40-bit um, keys. So anybody, even at the time, like, okay, at the time, we totally knew, like, contrary to what anybody might think, we totally knew that 40-bit keys were breakable. Um, we also knew that, in fact, they weren't even 40-bit keys. They were two keys, a 26-bit key and a 14-bit key. That were split, uh, which were really even more way more breakable. Um, frankly, it surprised a lot of us who understood how the system worked. Uh, DV this is DVD copy protection, by the way, which you know it became the thing that helped launch the most successful consumer media um, launch in the history of consumer media launches. Um, 
those, those, uh, the, the, the notion of the, the key length, like, you know, we were very much about, look, we just, we need to get this out. There's going to be, uh, you know, keep honest people honest. There's going to be some slop in the system. Um, but a, a, a huge compromise was that, that the only way to make this work in a specific consumer electronic uh, man manufacturers who was on the, the bleeding edge of shipping actual, you know, systems, right? They were supposed to start cranking sh millions of, of DVD players out of their factory in Japan. Um, was they had 10,000 free gates in an existing mask ROM and couldn't connect to the internet. So we had to come up with a solution that could fit inside, inside 10,000 gates, had to be 40-bit 40 uh, 40 keys or less because of Japanese regulation, and wound up being 26-bit and 14-bit keys um, in order to fit within the mask ROM and, and let that solution work. Uh, the alternative would have been retooling the whole factory in the mask ROM, which would have been an $80 million hit to that one company. Um, I, I was part of saying, you know what, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll go with that, that'll work. Um, uh, so, uh, around this time, um, there was also a thing called DivX um, version 1. Uh, DivX V1 was an attempt by a group of um, Hollywood lawyers, and LA lawyers, and um, some people at Microsoft, but not me, uh, some people at Microsoft to actually sort of make a, di make a DVD that was incompatible and was super secure and like all the devices had to phone home on a phone line every something and you know did but uh, uh, and uh, um, so so uh, you know I'll say that part of um, part of our learning experience on looking at the dark net and the use of technology and biased versus neutral technology has been based on working within a large company that um, was of two minds you know sometimes sometimes wanted things to be neutral and sometimes did not right um, uh, which is how you get yourself declared a, a monopoly so. Um, uh, we heard from Disney and Warner that th there would be no content above 40p without fixing the analog and digital holes. That was an adamant statement. That meant I needed to go out, and so I said, I, I worked for years trying to solve the, the, the content protection problem, which led me to the sort of light bolt of lightning, which sounds dramatic but really took a couple of years, that, that the notion of using DRM, using encryption, using technology to solve media distribution all up was a failure. Um, along that way, you know, we, we had started with a, oh, we're never going to get content past DVD resolution, so we'll never get 1080p. We knew that was coming um, without doing this thing that we started up inside Microsoft called Trusted Windows, which was a, a code name. Um, and the goal was to make you know, Windows PCs as good as protecting stuff as everyone else without destroying the ecosystem, right? That was a thing that was passionate for me and for the rest of the team. Um, uh, uh, and um, my, our conclusion from this was that biased technology allows for the concentration of power, which makes for more harm than good. Neutral te technology allows goodness to triumph naturally. So that, that sounds kind of um, highfalutin, but uh, a lot of the way we got to this conclusion, frankly, was through conversations we had with people like um, uh, Cory Doctorow, who was a chair at the EFF, I think, at the time, at the tail end of it, and Bunny Huang, who had just started doing his Xbox hacking at the time, and this is in the early 90s. Um, or sorry, early 2000s, like 2001, 2002, uh, and Seth Schoen, who's a, a technologist there. And, and what it really boiled down to for, for that conversation around how, how can we make uh, PCs more robustly secure and why would we want to do it around whether or not creating that security, whether or not inherent in, in that security um, was a bias that would lead to the concentration of power. Were there, were there other things like economic results of, of somebody making a PC more secure that would make, um, make for more bad, potentially more bad than good. And, and um, you know, our conclusion and the way we were building the technology and the way, uh, uh, the, the, the right way to do security technology, as, as Alan talked about in his uh, talk, is to make it just brutally neutral. Like, don't, don't make it, nep don't, don't think, I'm gonna make this technology great and nobody's gonna be able to use it to do harm. Right, so we're going to come up with a way to, to enable free speech unless it's free speech promoting child abuse, at which point it just won't work. I, I, technology should never be asked to do that. That's, th that's a job of policy, that's a job of education, that's a job of uh, a bunch of other things, but that is not the job of technology. Technology ought to be about making sure that everybody has a fair shot at whatever, you know, whatever the thing is. Access to the data, access to the content, connection between two nodes, connection around the world, communication. So I realize that this kind of looks like Joseph's uh, Technicolor Dreamcoat. Um, 
I'm only going to show this twice, and I'm going to go through it fast. But basically, what this has got me sort of thinking about is, so you've got basically a curve of people, and you've got this notion of people controlling access to that. And generally speaking, people are trying to you know, optimize for getting access for the main to the mainstream, right? Um, and then the further out into the margins you go, you, you, you people are looking to technology or law, CISPA, uh, et cetera, um, in order to appease, use FUD, fear, uncertainty, or doubt, manage, or just outright deny access to technology on the edges. And the interesting thing about this equation is that if you um, go back in time, what you wind up s finding is that, um, is that people have been doing this for thousands of years. So um, this is another quote from our, our session. If the dark net is efficient, then content will be rapidly pro propagated to all interested peers. What do you mean by rapidly, Peter? It took 4,000 years for poppies to go from a crop cultivated in Mesopotamia to grown in your front yard. And I love poppies, and here's why. Poppies are one of the few truly dual use, simultaneously evil and bad, highly regulated, and totally unfettered and unregulated uh, things in the world, and they're natural. If you take a handful of poppy seeds and throw them out in your yard, you will never get rid of those poppy seeds without like Agent Orange. They are incredibly persistent, and up until the moment that you slash one with a razor blade, you were totally fine. If I went out and picked a poppy and brought it in, I'm not a lawyer. I, hopefully there are lawyers in this room. Uh, so don't count this as legal advice, because I'm not qualified to give it to you. I've heard, and Michael Pollan did a really good, <laughs> I heard on the internet, <laughs> if you slash a, uh, a poppy with a razor blade, you are committing a felony, because that is a class two felony, uh, or class two drug. And it is managed as a uh, it's felony. It's managed as a highly controlled substance. The reason for that is is that this is called um, uh, uh, poppy latex. It's, it's like latex, um, and uh, that is that is you smoke that and that's opium right there, right? So whoosh, that's all you, all you just slash it, let it dry, put it in a pipe, smoke it. There you go. That's been true for thousands of thousands of years. People have been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. Poppies are also pretty flowers. They're weeds. They're almost impossible to get rid of. And people like poppy seed muffins. So you wind up with this sort of dual use no notion of, OK, we're going to find an, 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 a tentative, uneasy, but, uh, but acceptable middle ground. It's OK to grow poppies, even, a thou you know, even an acre of poppies in your yard. But if, you show, you know, if, if, if we show up in your yard with a search warrant and you've got an acre of poppies and they've all been slashed with a razor blade, then you are in seriously deep legal trouble. Um, and this is the Federal Controlled Substances Act of 1970, the definition section that's particularly interesting because it, it says the term production includes the manufacture, planting, cultivation, growing, or harvesting of a controlled substance. This is the harvesting. That slash is the harvesting of a controlled substance. So whoosh, bam, you have stepped out of the light net and into the dark net the instant you do that. So um, I'll repeat the question for the audience. Uh, who's making these decisions? Well, in this case, it was um, in way back in 1970, it was uh, the people that, uh, from the looks of the age in here, none of us voted for, or maybe a couple. Um, uh, they, they, they made that law, right? And it does have carve-outs for things like pharmaceuticals, that, like there's all this controlled substance, and are you a distributor, and distributor means, blah, 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 and you have to have done this, and this. Oh, yeah, and, and you can slash a poppy if you're a distributor and you're trying to make an opiate derivative in order to create pharmaceuticals, because then you're allowed. The government says that's okay. But if you're in your backyard and you just want to create, oh, I don't know, laudanum, right, because it's an easy way to self-medicate because you've got, you know, uh, terminal pain, actually, we would prefer that you buy the extraordinarily expensive and also highly addictive o Oxycontin um, rather than make yourself laudanum, which is just a pop poppy in grain alcohol. Um, uh, because, you know, allowing you unregulated access to it, even though you've got intense, you know, physical pain every day, is a price that we are not willing to pay in exchange for letting other people, you know, smoke it recreationally. Um, and actually, you know, if you look at uh, one of the one of the primary sort of in, in, in another uh, 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 plant that I love to look at for this. I mean, pot's obvious, but mandrake root. So mandrake root 
um, which is sort of both a highly pornographic looking route in some cases, which is, you know, was appealing in the Middle Ages, but also um, is also a hallucinogen, right? Uh, which I didn't know until fairly recently. I was like, why is everybody so big about Mandra? And I was like, oh, because it gets you high. Well, you know, the, 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 the church um, in the Middle Ages created basically this, this hundreds year long persistent uh, uh, story that, that, that they convinced people to believe in that if you plucked a mandrake root, you would actually instantaneously die. And there's instructions for how to pick mandrake that involve tying a, a leash around a dog to the mandrake root. And this is only for scientists. And then you run away and then you call the dog and the dog will pull the mandrake root out. The dog will keel over dead. Then you can go over and pick up the mandrake root um, and you're safe. Right, and and the reason you create that story is because back to unregulated flow of information. If what you're selling is salvation, and you you can eat a root and it feels kind of salvationy, then you don't want people to get access to that root. It's it's unregulated access to salvation, right? No, actually, you kind of would prefer they show up at church and then do their you know eight to ten hour shift, uh, which is less than we work now, by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, if you look at how, uh, how long serfs worked in the Middle Ages, you, you probably will find that you work a lot more than a serf. Um, uh, but, but if what you're selling is and what you're trying to control is salvation, then what you want to do is make sure that people don't have easy access to it themselves. So porn. Um, uh, we're talking about how long it takes for the dark net to hit something, right? So in 1953, porn's been around a lot longer since 1953, but I'm not, you know, going to go back infinitely. It goes back, obviously, much further than poppies, probably. I'm sure there were cave paintings of porn. What, what, what is, like, what is sort of porn in this context? Well, it's if somebody has something somebody else wants to see. It's a visual representation or, or written or whatever um, of the thing someone wants to see. Uh, 1953, we got Playboy, 65, Penthouse, 69, first mainstream movie, which I... I think, was that Debbie Does Dallas? I can't remember. Um, followed by a bunch of notable porn movies, porn theaters, 35 millimeter. So here's the funny thing about this. Um, this was all really super regulated and, and created, among other things, um, two, two phenomena. Uh, one, the societal norms in the places that distributed porn dictated sort of how tasteful the porn needed to be. So your ability to get at porn, and I know this personally um, because I was a child of the 70s, and I wanted to get my hands on porn. Um, uh, it was really hard to get your hands on it, and if you did, you were probably getting your hands on like your dad's or uncle's or somebody's Playboy or Penthouse, which was a, a highly airbrushed, highly stylized, very constrained view of sexuality, and in, in my case of women. Um, uh, and, and that actually um, created an imbalance around the distribution of you know, the information called porn. What then happened is it basically went digital. Um, Sex.com was registered in 94. Uh, DVD came out. I mean, right, I had to, I was the DVD evangelist for years and I had to explain to people what the purpose of multi-angle was in DVD. Yeah, uh, sports, it's gonna be great for sports because people love to watch sports repeats on, no. Um, so what happened? What happened here? What happened here was that it turns out that the unregulated flow of information between nodes in a network means that if I have something that other people want to see, I can take responsibility for that myself, I can take pictures, and I can make them available to other people. That, that is a dramatic sort of shift in the whole economy of porn. But it also has produced some kind of wonkiness, right? And the wonkiness is that anytime you have the unregulated flow of information, um, and, and we see this in a bunch of places, uh, uh, and porn's not the only one, Co internet commentar commentary, like everybody says never go to the bottom half of the internet, never read the comments on The Guardian, right, or anywhere else, right? It's because um, in the past, people who would have learned better than to be interested in that this thing because it's, it's repugnant, ha haven't, haven't learned about its repugnancy before they're in it. Like, if in, in other words, you can find yourself in hate speech at an age when you have still not formed the neurons to understand the difference between hate speech and non-hate speech. You can find yourself facing pornography that I never saw when I was 14 and, and shouldn't have when you're 14 because it's really easy to find. The, the scary thing about that is it means that when you're exposed to these kinds of information and you haven't formed the neurons in order to actually cope with it yet, you're building neurons in real time. And, and by the way, you're building neurons that none of us have. You're building neural pathways in your brain when you encounter porn on the internet at the age of 10 
that I never made and I will never make because I haven't formed neurons since my teen years and none of us have, right? You build neurons up until you're about a teenager, sometime between 15 and 25, let's say, and then you're done, that's it, right? All the heavy drinking, everything, that just kills neurons. It doesn't actually build new ones. Although there's some science that says that that's changing. But um, what that means is that access to information before you have the means of coping with it well shapes the way you think and shapes how you interact with it. And we're seeing that in some positive ways, people getting access to information that like the man doesn't want us to know that's actually probably healthy for us to know. Um, like presidential letters. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing the opposite end of that, and that is that people are being exposed to information by the dark net, by the internet, right, by this unregulated flow of information that we haven't prepared them for because we didn't see it coming, and they're having to build coping strategies and mechanisms themselves. And, and I, my personal theory, and I, I, I hope that there's some interesting science that either proves me right or wrong, is that part of what we're seeing in this this seeming rash, although I think statistically it's not actually probably a rash of, um, of, of rapes uh, that are being filmed by kids, is, is related to this. It's related to the fact that access to, to, um, to visual images that are, that are designed to be demeaning or shameful are accessible to people who you know, can get them very easily, right? And that helps shape the way their brain works um, and then help, helps sort of, it, it shapes the way they interact with things. So I want to shift, shift to talk about riots. Uh, there's an awesome picture that I could not find of an Egyptian woman, um, probably in her 40s, uh, uh, scarf, but you could see her whole face holding a rock. Uh, it's a beautiful picture, and when I saw it, it was in the middle of the, uh, the, uh, the Arab uprising, and I, I remember sending it out to a bunch of my friends and saying, you know, th these guys are gone, right? Um, they're, go they're gone, meaning the government's gone, because as soon as this woman who, who, who looked, there was just, there was sort of an elegance and dignity to her, and the fact that she was carrying a rock up to the throwers on the front line to throw meant that when you, when you've, when you've, when you've, when, when the, when the, when the system is, has crumbled enough so that the mainstream is now carrying rocks up to the fanatics, like, okay, total, uh, uh, total unregulated flow of information and rocks, right? Um, and a good example of what happens when you try harder and harder and harder to use technology to regulate the flow of information, sooner or later when things break down, they break down spectacularly. Right, like they just go kaboom. This picture is from the Intifada, but I love the fact that she just threw a rock and she took her shoes off because she knew she couldn't get a good throw, right? And so like, you know, like if you're chucking rocks with a yellow scarf, which by the way matches the shoes, <laughs> then, um, Something has gone terribly wrong in local and federal government wherever you're doing this, right? Uh, so UK riots, which blew a bunch of people away, me included, and they started, um, the first fire was set about 10 blocks, 10 or 20 blocks north of uh, where I had a flat in London when I lived there for a year and a half. Um, Blackberry Messenger, BBM, was widely regarded as actually being the dark net of choice for the distribution of information around how people used unregulated flow of information to show up in places the cops weren't ready because they couldn't see into BBM. BBM is actually a very secure network. Um, uh, do bad things and then leave before the cops get there. So this is a direct quote from one of the BBM messages that was um, broken. Everyone in Edmonton, Enfield, Woodgreen, everywhere in North, link up, town station four, at four o'clock sharp, you know, um, you know, bring your ba bowies and your bags, your trolleys, cars, vans, hammers, the lot, right? Basically, Come, you know, come, come to do evil, come to break a bunch of stuff, um, and then we'll get out of here before the cops show up. Um, this was a dark net. This is the, this is the, you know, the scary dark side of the unregulated flow of information. Um, so here's a, uh, another quote: If you're competing with the dark net, you must compete in the dark net's own terms. So uh, we talked about Divix already. Napster. Um, in June of 1999, I was working in this thing called the Secure Digital Music Initiative, which, if you say it really fast. It's SDMI, so they say it like a word. Yeah. Um, it was an attempt to uh, basically re-regulate the digital distribution of music. And um, uh, I had 
was working with a lot of the same people in SDMI that I'd been working with in C CPTWG. SDMI was kind of actually designed to be produced bias technology, which is, I think, one of the reasons that it failed. Um, but in June of 1999, I, I don't know how I found out about it. It's like 7 o'clock in the morning. Napster.com went live. Um, and I uh, phoned up one of my uh, um, uh, friends uh, at Warner Music, and I said, hey, go to your, you know, in front of a browser. He goes, yeah. And I go, okay, type in go to Napster.com. He goes, okay, types in Napster.com. It was about 20 minutes of silence, and then, holy shit. Like, and then just, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I said at the time, so this was right when we had just started to figure out, okay, what you got to do if you're going to compete with your own stolen product is do a better job of providing your own legitimate product. And I told him, I said, okay, what you ought to do tomorrow is put your entire catalog online, unlock the whole thing, no DRM, 20 bucks a month. Like, you will, you will rock. They didn't do that, unfortunately. I like the old Napster. It was very user-friendly and had great music selection. Napster was the greatest program. You could find all the music new and old on it, right? Um, I'm, you know, people liked it because it was free, but in reality, if you want to go after the mainstream, if what you've done is said, you could actually do this, very user-friendly, great music selection, all the music for 20 bucks a month, let's say, I, I think, you know, you would have had millions of subscribers in, 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 in weeks. I mean, it would have been... It would have been a phenomenal success for the 90s. Um, if there are subverted hosts, then content will leak into the uh, darknet. So this is a quote from the then head of, um, or chief arch software architect uh, of uh, Microsoft. I'd rather they steal office than pay for something else. That was actually a pretty pragmatic thing. I, it, he said this in a meeting um, uh, I was in with him in the late 90s, right? So that is basically going off the assumption that there's going to be subverted hosts. Stuff is going to leak in the, into the dark net. I'd rather they use mine than somebody else's because that gives me a shot at them later, right? Um, walled gardens. So uh, walled gardens essentially seek to regulate the flow of information. They, they create basically two things. Um, an attention deficit economy. What you want to do is reduce the amount of attention that can get spent so that you can point it at your end of aisle displays, right? Your music selections, your book selections, your this, your that, access to this, access to that, so that you can derive a higher profit margin. Walled gardens are sort of inherently subject to dark netting, and, and if they want to protect themselves, need to find ways to make sure, if we go back to those controls we talked about, that um, you can't get access to them. So, for example, uh, if you have a phone that can only install software uh, from an app store, then that's the only way you're going to get to it. Um, all right, I'm, I'm running late, so I'm going to speed up here. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Do I need that? Okay. So we were building this thing called Palladium, um, which was what Trusted Windows became. It then became the next generation secure computing base because we had to change the name for a stupid reason. Uh, and what it was all about was actually just creating a space that anybody could create on a PC in order to protect their own stuff. It didn't actually allow people to monitor what was happening so you couldn't, in fact, see inside a container I created. So I can create a container. I can talk about overthrowing the government. It's going to be just as strongly protected as uh, Disney's movies, right? Disney's going to get to figure out how to control what Disney has access to uh, and who has access to their stuff. I get to decide if I'm setting up my own container, who has access to my stuff. Um, that's how it was designed to work. The interesting thing about Palladium, which is a huge lesson for me, and for the team, because it was a, it was a, it was, it was rough, right? Was the level of fear um, uh, about Microsoft and about people trying to take this open, beautiful, you know, technology called personal computing and the internet and turn it into something else? There was so much fear around that that Palladium became sort of part of the rallying cry for a group of people who said, "This is just an attempt to actually destroy the internet and destroy computing as you know it," and and it like blew us away. I mean, I did not see it coming, uh, you know, and, and you can call me stupid for that. But we published this paper that said that, <laughs> like, I, I run the Palladium team, and I'm saying DRM doesn't work in a scientific peer-reviewed paper that's being published in, in 2002. That ought to be a convincing statement that we're not trying to use Palladium, because the four people who wrote the paper all work on Palladium, um, that, in fact, uh, this technology is going to be great for keeping things secret, but not great for protecting movies in mass market, um, uh, and that got missed. So we basically got, you know, spent a couple years getting the crap pounded out of us by um, some very smart, but in some cases uh, well-informed, other cases 
poorly informed people um, around what that technology might do. And we ultimately really had to, I mean, it, it, it died, right? It died on the vine. Some stuff came out of it, though. Um, and BitLocker is a, a disk encryption solution. Um, BitLocker actually uses the same threat model, which is a dark net threat model, which is that if somebody steals your machine, you, you they're now the user. Giving them access as the user of the machine to everything that's on the machine is probably a bad idea because it's your machine. It has all your stuff on it. You probably don't want them to get access to it. That's why it's encrypted. Um, so you can protect some of the stuff some of the time. You can't protect all of, the all of the stuff all of the time forever. If enough people want something, somebody will find a way to get it. And once they have found a way, they will leak it into the dark net, which is to say Usenet, BitTorrent, uh, everywhere else. Um, and, and it will be now free forever. The same is true of a picture of someone beating up a protester. The same is true um, of, uh, as we just saw in the Boston Marathon, pictures of really horribly maimed people being widely distributed very quickly in an unregulated way. That never would have happened 20 years ago. We actually, as Americans, have been insulated from that kind of imagery for our for forever. Right? We've never seen it. A lot of other places in the world, you see that stuff all the time. We've never seen it. This is like, one of the, I, I'd say, one of the most um, pivotal moments was the fact that, uh, has everybody seen the unedited version of versions of some of those pictures? I, I have. Um, and, and I wanted to because I wanted to, uh, I, wanted to f I wanted to feel inside, like the rage and the horror and the, like, you know, that everybody else gets to feel all the time because, because you know, their villages are getting blown up, so they see it with their own eyes. Um, yeah, but, but that, dis that unregulated distribution, like we were trying to protect ourselves successfully for 100 years from having to ever see that imagery, right? We never saw World War II imagery that like that. We didn't see Vietnam Im imagery. It was all protected from us, right? Life occasionally would publish a picture that was shocking and horrifying, and uh, you know, w we can remember those because they're seared in our brain. There's, there weren't that many of them, and it was really a tightly controlled medium. Um, all right, so... We're winding up. Barrel proofing. Um, actually, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to skip it. Desktop printing. Um, desktop printing is an interesting metaphor for the advent of technology because at one point it cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, in order to set up a really good print shop. And you needed incredible training in order to do it. There were a small number of people who could do it well. Um, and they you know, had a great business. Let's say this is 1950. You wanted to print um, a brochure for your advertising agency or a wedding advertisement. You went to the print shop and you, you know, basically paid for the amortization of the education, the scarcity of the resource, um, the expertise, and the equipment because it's very expensive. And it's hard and finicky and it's right? You got to know how to do the ink. Da -da -da. Right, okay. So along comes computing technology. And we see that all of a sudden for, let's say, $5,000, you can do a relatively decent version of printing something out. Um, and then that goes to $2,000 and the quality goes up. And then that goes to $1,000 and the quality goes up. And now inkjet printers, which can print very high resolution, photographic qual quality reproductions, sell for under $100. Oh, and by the way, they use DRM in order to try to make sure that it's still a profitable business because that's controlling the ink, which is an interesting thing. This took about 20 years, I'm going to say. Maybe 30. So um, what about the future? 3D printing. I think that 3D printing is basically following the exact same technology curve as desktop publishing. 3D printing today is at the moral equivalent of the transition between dot matrix printers and laser jet printers for at home from a cost and a what you can do with it. So a lot of people are like, wow, 3D printing, that's really cool. I can print a not very good reproduction of a tape, like a paperweight. Right, which is what you would have been saying. Wow, that's a really ugly brochure you created, Stan. You used Comic Sans and three other fonts. You've got the ant border around the outside, <laughs> right? Um, uh, and you've got lots of exclamation points. Oh, and you used the balloon clip art, right? Because what Stan would have been producing with desktop publishing when he could get at it and he had a dot matrix printer and it cost roughly $4,000, let's say, was crap, right? But at the tail end of that is two interesting phenomenon. First of all, we desktop publish every single day. And the print industry did not die. Like there is still a need, because it turns out that Stan 
doesn't understand why it is that Comic Sans is going to make anybody who cares about fonts want to die a quiet, actually not a quiet, a very rage-filled, loud death. Um, so, so this is where we are, where I think, right now. We are basically at the transition between dot matrix printers and laser printers for 3D printing. You can buy a 3D printer for under a grand. It's going to make a nice paperweight or some toys. It'll also make guns. So people are like, well, but you can't really 3D print a gun. Guaranteed you're going to be able to print start to finish a working, highly lethal gun in the next 10 years for the same reason that when Stan was busy typing away, creating his awesome looking, hideous, you know, uh, party invite, 10 years later could produce an extremely slick looking thing. The software was there to convince him not to use Comic Sans. And if he wanted to get a slightly better version, he could actually prototype just like you can with 3D printing, uh, on a cheap machine and then produce on an expensive machine that you could rent time on, which is the equivalent of going to Kinko's. You prototype on your machine, you produce at Kinko's, that's where we're going. So at some point in the next 10 to 20 years, somebody is going to 3D print a gun and kill somebody with it. And based on what we know from uh, the phenomenon of the dark net, society is going to go utterly bonkers because something that we all counted on being highly regulated or some people want highly regulated and other people staunchly want completely unregulated is now technically completely unregulated. So what's going to happen? Well, the machines are going to get banned. Only that won't work because the machines can print themselves. Then, <laughs> think about it. Yep. Then the chemicals are going to get banned, but that's not going to work because the chemicals are just chemicals. It's like powdered aluminum. You can't ban powdered aluminum. You can't ban thermoplastic. You can't ban resins. So then they're going to get regulated, which means that the only place you're supposed to be able to buy the chemicals is from these guys, only it's going to turn out that there's also unregulated chemicals because those are much cheaper and they have the colors faster and you can get a better mix and blah, 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 blah. So people will stu still do that just like you can do your own fill your own ink cartridges thing. If you don't want to pay $30 for an ink cartridge, you only want to pay $5 for an ink cartridge, you can fill your own ink cartridge. You just cut off the RFID, tape it onto the next one so that the printer won't not work when you have it there. Or you can just tape the RFID permanently and then just live with the out of ink error message that you're going to get because it thinks that RFID is there forever. Knives, same thing. Forks. <laughs> okay, so if you're in the creating attractive utility utilitarian wear business, which is kind of like being in the pop music business 20 years ago, or the desktop publishing business a while ago, then you are facing a future where anybody can print their own fork and or print your fork. So you produce a fork, it's the best fork ever. And then somebody else is printing it at home the next day out of metal that may even be better than what you printed it out of because you were going for cost optimizations and they're willing to spend more on the materials. Baby stroller parts is a great example. It's, uh, there's a little hinge thing that was like $295 from the Italian baby stroller part manufacturer. You can print those off for less than $40 in, in uh, chemicals. Drugs. You know, like uh, just you, it's, It sounds wacky, but just keep following it. DNA. Surveillance. So, in the UK, access to a public surveillance camera is regulated um, by the government, and the government is the only one who has access to the feed. Uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, so don't quote me on that. Um, you have to subpoena to get it, and frequently you'll get access to a feed that's been redacted, so you get like a 22-second clip out of a five-minute scene, and you'll say, why didn't you get the rest? And then they'll say, well, because of terrorism, because that's a great excuse to not give you anything. Um, the dark net, actually, as a, as a, if you think about it, what if what we did was 3D printed cheap cameras that were solar powered, crowdsourced the, the paying for those cameras, and then epoxied them to every single surveillance camera on the planet, and then set them up as open IP feeds? Okay, we're not going to get rid of the cameras. We know that. At least we can get access to the exact same visuals so that we don't have to subpoena and get told, oh, I'm sorry. Terrorism says that we can't show you that guy beating up that other guy with a stick, right? Um, yeah, so what that gives us is unregulated access to information that we might otherwise not have access to. So he here's an idea. Start a Kickstarter. Find a way to you know, build a $10 essentially throwaway camera. Build a million of them. Super, super glue them or epoxy them to other people's cameras. Set them up on a public network. Set up an IP address. Now at least we all have access to the same information. Drones, um, same thing. 
I actually am kind of more optimistic about drones now than I was because 3D printing means we'll be able to print our own drones. That means we can build counter drones to the bastard drones, <laughs> right, which I kind of like. So I'm a big fan of that. I have some ideas if anybody wants to kickstart a, um, a counter drone drone program. Um, terrorism and public safety, we saw in the Boston Marathon situation the unregulated access to information, both the bright side and the brilliant side and the dark side of it. The dark side of it was we saw basically flash mobs smearing the names of people who were going to show up in search engine queries for the next 10 years as being terrorists who had absolutely nothing to do with what happened there at all. But that is what happens when you provide people with the unregulated um, uh, uh, flow of information. Okay, so how's the dark net going to change? How is this technology changing? Nodes are going to become links. Namespaces will become infinitely distributed. Content is going to self-distribute. And content will become the dark net itself. What that basically means is things that we've learned how to do since we wrote that paper guarantee that there's no freaking way you're going to put the genie back in the bottle and regulate the flow of information. I can just take videos of a sunset, embed an infinite quantity of information in that video of the sunset, and then send it to you, and you will be able to find that information in that with the keys I provided you with, and nobody else will be able to find it. So, a few proposals. Accept that we cannot control the flow of information. It's over. Get over it. Move on. Education is critical. I think um, we are doing a, a craptastic job of preparing our children to form neural pathways that none of us have. This is for everything from access to porn, to ideas, to, hey, let's go break some windows, to, I want to print a gun and bring it to school. Education in, in the realities of that, unbiased education around, this is, this is what it means to have access to information, of, uh, access to pictures of, of naked people. This is what it means to have access to drugs. This is what it means um, to have access to, 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 to technology. Um, we need to stop, a uh, uh, CTO of McAfee said, uh, this great quote, I'm going to mangle it, but um, we're, we're tourists trying to teach the natives, right? We need natives teaching natives. Educate natives as natives. Don't try to turn them into tourists. Um, I had an experience over December where I ran a series of conversations on my Facebook wall about gun control, um, and one of my proposals was, just to see how it went, mandatory uh, gun education for all children. There are 300 million guns in the United States. There are approximately between 700 and 800 kids killed by accidentally negligent discharges of guns. If you could cut that in half by preparing them to understand what to do when they encounter a gun, as opposed to just trying to ignore it, that might actually produce a positive result. The interesting thing was, the language people were using who were really highly resistant to this idea is the exact same language I saw around sex education 30 years ago. Hell no, I don't want my kids to know that they have genitals. No, 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 because then they might try to use them. Right, which we, as we know, um, worked really well. Elect some natives. I think we have a couple of years. There are basically no natives in, in government, digital natives, right? There is basically no one in I mean, maybe 5%, 1%, half a percent. Not really. Um, we need to elect some freaking natives, right? Because we're going to see CISPAs and DMCAs and WIPOs and judges, stupid, 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 and more stupid over and over again until we've got some people who are part of the fabric of what is being regulated as opposed to not. You know, it's like, oh, Twitter's stupid. Well, yeah, but if you're passing laws that regulate Twitter, maybe you ought to be someone who uses Twitter. Um, build neutral, non-biased technology like oh, services that actually help people connect and interact with other people without inherent bias. That's my ad. That's what we're doing. Um, the more robust the end nodes, the less awful the bottom half of the internet will become. If you prepare kids and people to understand that there are whack jobs on the internet who say stupid, racist, homophobic, sexist, and horrible things, and who occasionally do the same things in the real world, then they will be inoculated against that, causing them to become more inclined to think of that as being as acceptable behavior. So what, what the dark net says is control is getting pushed further and further out. The last node is right here. Like that's it. That's the end of the network. So rather than seek to build neural shunts into our brains, which by the way, I jokingly proposed in a SDMI meeting and somebody said, that's a great idea. When can we do that? I mean, they were sincere. I was like, well, we could just put in neural shunts that shut off your eyeballs when you see a movie that you're not supposed to see, or shut off your ears when you hear a song you're not supposed to hear, and they're like, that's great. When can you do that? 
Um, let's, instead of trying to think that we can regulate brains, let's make them robust to having their own solid sort of view and understanding of the way the world works um, and ought to work uh, uh, and make them better prepared and then the world will be a better place. Um, diplomacy requires compromise. You talked about diplomacy. Uh, uh, I'm sorry about DVD regionalization. I proposed it in the lobby, I think, of the high, like the, I don't know, probably the Burbank Airport Hilton. <laughs> and, and they were like, okay, yeah. Um, they were, they were going to try to make it a mandated law to that you had to honor regionalization. I said, well, why don't you just stick it in part of the license for decrypting a DVD, and then I'll have to, you know, Windows will have to honor it in order to get access to that. I think it's a stupid idea, but fine, right? So if you've ever railed against DVD regionalization, know that if we hadn't done that compromise, which was part of the technical diplomacy we were doing at the time, you never would have been able to play a DVD legitimately on a device, which would mean you would have had to wait until DVD was cracked. We don't know if the format even would have taken off. Um, I, 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 I still am proud of that, but it's one of those things where unless you've done diplomacy, you know, political diplomacy or technical diplomacy, you don't, you know, you don't realize that sometimes you get, oh okay, uh, that's a, you know, I'm not actually compromising on my, my moral fiber, but I'm, I'm letting a little bit go on, on uh, practical reality. Um, where we want to go is a place where everybody gets access to information, and they're all much better at it. That's it. Thank you. That was amazing. Uh,